start with a health warning. My speech is not suitable for children, which is sadly ironic given that all of the extreme and inappropriate material I'm about to share has already been shared with children in our schools. As a former biology teacher, I've delivered my fair share of sex education, and teaching the facts of life often comes with more than a little embarrassment for teachers and pupils alike. And I remember teaching about reproduction when I was about 30 weeks pregnant with my first baby. One child asked me if my husband knew I was pregnant. Another, having watched a video on labour and birth, commented, Miss, that's really going to hurt, you know. Just as children don't know about photosynthesis or the digestive system without being taught, neither do they know the facts of reproduction. So it's important that children are taught clearly and truthfully about sex, and of course there's a lot more to sexual relationships than just anatomy. Now many people believe that parents should take the leading role in teaching children about relationships, since one of the main duties of parenting is to pass on wisdom and values to children. Nevertheless, there are families where parents can't or don't teach children effectively about relationships, and it's also sadly now the case that the internet presents children with a vast array of false and damaging information about sex. So there is widespread consensus that schools do have a role to play in relationships and sex education. And that's why the government chose to make the teaching of relationships and sex education compulsory in all secondary schools from September 2020 with the aims, according to the guidance, of helping children manage their academic, personal and social lives in a positive way. But less than two years later, the current Education Secretary has written to the Children's Commissioner asking for her for help in supporting schools to teach RSE because, in his words, we know that the quality of RSE is inconsistent. Mr Chairman, my right honourable friend, the Education Secretary, is right that the teaching of sex education is inconsistent. Unlike maths or science or history, there are no widely adopted schemes of work or examinations, and so the subject matter and materials do vary widely between different schools. But inconsistency should be the least of my right, on, right honourable friend's concerns when we look at the reality of what is actually being taught. Because despite its good intentions, the new RSE framework has opened the floodgates to a whole host of external providers who offer sex education materials to schools and now children across the country are being exposed to a plethora of deeply inappropriate, wildly inaccurate, sexually explicit and damaging materials in the name of sex education. This is extremely concerning for a number of reasons. Firstly, if we fail to teach children clearly and factually about relationships, sex and the law, they will be exposed to all sorts of risks. For example, if you define sex as anything that makes you horny or aroused, the definition offered by the sex education provider, the School of Sexuality Education, how does a child understand the link between sex and pregnancy? The Sex Education Forum tells children they fall into one of two groups, menstruators or non-menstruators. If a teenage girl's periods don't start, what will she think? How does she know this isn't normal? How does she know to consult a doctor? How will she know she's not pregnant? Will she just assume she's one of the non-menstruators? The book for teachers, Great Relationships and Sex Education, suggests an activity for 15-year-olds where children are given prompt cards and have to say whether they think certain types of sexual acts are good or bad. How do the children know which acts come with risks of health, health risks or risks of pregnancies or STDs? If we tell children that love has no age, the slogan used in a diversity role models resource, do we undermine their understanding of the legal age of consent? Sex education provider Bish informs children that most people would say they had a penis and testicles or a clitoris and a vagina. However, many people are in the middle of the spectrum with how their bodies are configured. Now, as a former biology teacher, I don't even know to, where to start with that one. As adults, we often fail to remember what it's like to be a child, and we make the mistake of assuming that children know more than they do. But children have all sorts of misconceptions, and that's why it's our responsibility to teach them factually, truthfully, and in age-appropriate ways so that they can make informed decisions. Another concern relates to the teaching of consent. Of course, it's vitally important to teach about consent, and the Everyone's Invited revelations make this abundantly clear. But we must remember that under the law, children can't consent to sex. Sex education classes conducted by the group It Happens 
told boys of 13 and 14 that the law is not there to punish young people for having consensual sex. It's just two 14-year-olds who want to have sex with each other and who are consensually having sex. It's not hard to see the risks of this approach, which normalises and legitimises underage sex. Not only are children legally not able to consent, they also don't have the developmental maturity or capacity to consent to sexual activity. That is the point of the age of consent. The introduction of graphic or extreme sexual material in sex education lessons also reinforces the porn culture that is damaging our children in such a devastating way. Of course, it is not the fault of schools that half of all 14-year-olds have seen pornography online, much of it violent and degrading. But some RSE lessons are actively contributing to the sexualisation and adultification of children. The Proud Trust has produced a dice game encouraging children to discuss explicit sexual acts based on the role of a dice. The six sides of the dice name different body parts, such as anus, vulva, penis, mouth and objects. Two dice are thrown and children must name a pleasurable sexual act that can take place between those two body parts. The game is aimed at children of 13 and over. SexWise is a website run and funded by the Department for Health and recommended in the Department for Education's RSE guidance. The website is promoted in schools and contains the following advice. Maybe you read a really hot bit of erotica while looking up dominance and submission. Remember, sharing is caring. Sex education materials produced by BISH training involve discussion of a wide range of sexual practices, some of them violent. This includes rough sex, spanking, choking, BDSM and kink. BISH is aimed at young people of 14 and over and provides training materials for teachers. Even when materials are not extreme, we must still be careful not to sexualise children prematurely. I spoke to a mother who told me how her 11-year-old son had been shown a PowerPoint in a lesson on sexuality, setting out characteristics and behaviours and asking children to read through the lists and decide if they were straight, gay or bisexual. Prepubescent 11-year-olds are not straight, gay or bisexual, they are children. And even school's Diversity Week, a celebration of LGBTQIA+, promoted by the Just Like Us group, leads to the sexualisation of children. Of course schools should celebrate diversity and promote tolerance. But why are we doing this by asking pre-sexual children to align themselves with adult sexual liberation campaigns? And let's not forget that the plus includes kink, BDSM and fetish. <laughs>